Welcome to Beyond Bitcoin, a podcast about all things digital assets, the global communities they are creating, the generations that are using and investing in them, and the challenges faced by the nations that are seeking to regulate them. The content of this program is not to be taken as investment advice. The opinions expressed in the program by the host and the guests are their personal opinions only. Remember, feel free to subscribe and share with like-minded friends. My name is Derek Graham. I'm the CEO of Portal Asset Management, and my co-host is Nitin Gower, Managing Director of State Street Digital Assets. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world, and welcome along to another episode of Beyond Bitcoin. My name is Derek Graham, and with me today, of course, is my friend and colleague, Nitin Gower. Hey, Nitin. Hey, Derek. Glad to be here, this time back in the US. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell you what. You get around, and we as a show gets around too. That's and so true. last week, of course, we were interviewing our special guests in Dubai, being the team at Crypto Oasis, and getting an insight into exactly what the Dubai ecosystem is like and how it is growing. Oh, by the way, that reminds us that Gitex, the global tech, the That's biggest right. tech show in the world, is on this Saturday, October 10 to 14 in Dubai. So that should be truly amazing. But this week, we're jumping back to India with a special guest from Snapper Future Tech to discuss a topic dear to your heart, Nitin, and that's the IBM from your IBM days, and that is Hyperledger, the enterprise-based blockchain, and more broadly, what is happening in this second largest, possibly the largest user of blockchain solutions in the world, India. Over to you, Nitin. No, oh, thank you, Derek. And again, this is both the topic, the country we're covering is close to my heart. Being an Indian, I keep a tab on what's happening in the in the homeland, uh, looking into what's going on, both in terms of the population, but also in terms of uptake of technology and crypto assets. And so I'm, it's a really joy to introduce Kamlesh. And Kamlesh and me go back through our IBM days. And he, again, moved on and done really well for himself as a CTO of Snap of Future, TEDx speaker. Uh, he also is the Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee, which actually is an honor um, to be a member of that, to shape the industry from technology perspective. Also an IEEE blockchain mentor, and I can go on and on in, of, of his accolades. But recently he was nominated as one of the influencing voices in India. So Kamlesh, a real honor. Welcome to our podcast. And tell us a bit more about your journey to our audiences as you navigate through this. And again, it took you almost a decade. We've, we've been in this journey in to, to get to a point where you are in, in one of the leading voices in the country and shaping not just technology, but also the regulatory elements that we, that we will discuss today. So I'll, pa I'll pause here, Kamlesh, to get your thoughts. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Nitin, and thank you, Derek, for inviting. So... I'd like Nisim mentioned, I, I was a part of the IBM team and uh, from the day time my blockchain journey start as a working with uh, IBM GBS on the time. And unlike other people who started their blockchain career with cryptocurrency and trading in the crypto and building some kind of their coins, but I started my blockchain career with building some kind of enterprise solution that is beyond Bitcoin itself in the 2016. And intrinsic to the first kind of pilot project I did in the IBM GBS that was a travel and transportation, how you can use the blockchain in kind of car sharing uh, business. So that was the first first use case. And in the because IBM is a very good company to learn and explore the your uh, technical and your synergies. So I part of the various blockchain initiatives in the IBM G, IBM, IBM group like IBM research and part of the uh, top from the IBM accelerator program. So that is actually a program run by the IBM every year. And I was a mentor to the blockchain startups in early 2016 and 17. So that, that was the early my career, career move. And then because blockchain is moving across the country and people are exploring, there are lots of startup coming and all these startups are struggling in terms of the skills, skill set, like especially the who want to build the enterprise solution. So they generally want to build on the hyperledger tech stack. And the skills were very, very, very rare. So I was mentoring the couple of blockchain startup on the time. And I joined the Estimate Future Tech as a vice president in 2018. And then, then we emerged from that time to now having a 
serving the couple of customer in government of india working with financial services sectors in, in indian business and and lots of other other customer in us and you in all is mostly on the enterprise sector so mostly other startup like building some crypto exchange and nfts and other things but we as a company mostly working on the enterprise segment so that was my career uh, starting and currently in the ecosystem perspective like i represent the indian ecosystem in the in, the, in terms of the blockchain influencer in the digital transformation and even uh, part of the recent part of the apiri which is the center of excellence by the government of india yeah. to promoting the blockchain ecosystem i think that is also great move by the indian ecosystem to how they can promote the uh, blockchain ecosystem blockchain startup so i was part of that uh, apiri which is center of excellence in the blockchain for supporting the blockchain startup so that 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 was a, is a pretty my last 6 uh, 7 year journey Correct. in blockchain Got it. No, no. So you you're also at this point in time vacationing in Indore, and thanks again for taking time during your vacation. And some so Indore is a tier three city, which so the world knows the big you know the Bangalore and the Delhi and the Mumbai. But Indore is again a, a growing city, and you have many such tier three cities. And one of the stats that I read, Kamlesh, is that tier three cities are the fastest growing ecosystem in India. Some stat, I think, the India to me, uh, the ownership rate is almost double the global average. So an average country has ranging between one to fifteen percent. India has thirty percent of of overall crypto ownership in India, um, which again is primarily fueled by the cities like Indore and Pune and many of the other sort of growing communities. um we've also seen sort of you know um as far as the you know the times of india has reported that investment made by indians in cryptocurrencies is upwards of 10 billion dollars collectively in, in a country which is still sort of emerging economy and you have a a, a very large middle class sector so being in indore at the moment what is your like how do you see this like what is the uh do you get this conversation with chai walas when you hang it out to have chai and for the audience chai wala is someone when you it's a co- common cultural thing to have a cup of tea in the morning in your in your corner tea store uh what is the what does the feel like what is the uptake yeah so so even uh, just yesterday i was uh, uh in the bhopal which is the capital of madhya pradesh as the one of the yeah. state so even even tier 3 city like in the even even the smaller than in those so i was i was speaking in one of the private university and about the blockchain and very interesting to see the only the first year engineering graduate have very clear understanding about the blockchain they know what is happening in the bitcoin and cryptocurrency they understand the nft space even even they understand like what is happening in the real trends like suppose like listen to the binance uh, smart chain hack right and that's just the they ask question about this binance smart chain hack hack, hack. so i think uh, now in the even indian tier to tier three cities uh, the engineering graduates so the people who are uh, not living in the bigger cities understand the ecosystem and uh, having the good presence in terms of what is happening even 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 this particular university having a having a 64 startups incubated in the tier three cities wow so that is very interesting to see like like one smaller city one private university providing some kind of startup ecosystem building and and the engineering graduates who are doing their first year and second year engineering they started their own companies and even interestingly wow. there are some blockchain startup in the tier two so i think no need to move to the some bigger cities like bangalore and mumbai now this smaller city is creating the blockchain ecosystem so even in those like they having i think more than 50 blockchain startup there and working in the blockchain space So I think that is interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's true. I think that's a very empowering, right? That back in the day, people leave the smaller cities and go to larger cities, in 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 tune of opportunities. And and I think on this show itself, Derek and me have discussed the empowering notion around crypto, how it empowers people not just as a medium of exchange and store of value, but also the ecosystem that's evol- revolving around it. And I personally, in my last visit. of course i was in 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 uh, in delhi and bangalore but uh, as as the tier 1 cities but in my conversation with the ecosystem a lot of startup companies is trying to stretch their startup capital the capital they get to start businesses in moving to tier 2 and 3 cities because the cost of doing business is a lot less and all they need is talent 
And yeah. we've compared, you know, blockchain to 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 nation state status on, on this show, where at this at this point in time, it doesn't really matter who you are, where you live with. In fact, Kanpur, uh, you yeah. know, uh, Derek talks about Gaitex, and Gaitex actually has a, a interesting friend of mine, and we should probably Derek get him on our show. Uh, Gaurav Gaurav is leading. Uh, TD5, which is one of the biggest ecosystems in Dubai with this connection and development ecosystem evolving in Kanpur. Kanpur is another tier two city. So I think from that perspective, super interesting. One thing you mentioned, Kamlesh, in your preamble on, on you know, early on as you were introducing yourself is in terms of the focus from the government apparatus. As you know, India, you know, in, 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 in countries like India, government play a very vital role because of the financial services, but also Ministry of Information, Ministry of Communication, Ministry of Finance collectively have done well. So some, some things that I, I dug up into in my last trip was the National Informatics Center, and I think you were mentioning this earlier, has established Center of Excellence. Yeah. You have Niti Aayog that actually has a Niti Aayog is planning commission, by the way, for many of them which is at a national level, a planning commission that plans the five-year, 10-year journey of India's evolution, has a strategy paper on blockchain that covers the fundamental of DLT technology and its potential framework. There are various projects that came out of this the National Informatics, Informatics Center in applying technology to things like, you know, your your uh, electronic healthcare record management system, vehicle lifecycle management system, going after insurance and electronics, METI, which is the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, released the national strategy on, on blockchain strategy, right? Which is basically how do we... So you have all these government ecosystem with massive focus, some level of investment, gearing up and, and energizing the nation to begin to invest in this in, into this tech. Yeah. What is the downstream trickle-down effect of these initiatives? Because I also see the taxation, which is rather... Um, you know, quite burdensome for the crypto investors and folks who are trying to get into the space from a crypto perspective, not necessarily from technology perspective. And that actually has caused a lot of challenges in terms of a down, uh, you know, downgrade in, in the normal uptake and transaction volumes in the country. So I see this positioning of technology. I also see this draconian measure in terms of not having the right regulatory clarity, which I think is a global problem anyway, and then having this high taxation structure. Is there a balance there? I mean, what's the, what's, what is your vantage point here? So I think what I, what I realize from the government standpoint, like, so there are multiple fronts. So one is like, they're having a national strategy at the, at the national level, like from the Niti Aayog or from the Planning Commission, MITE, and creating the startup ecosystem by the Ministry of IT and Telecom, where the IDI is mentioned, is a mentor there. And not just the national level, but India have a different divisional kind of states. So different states also started and having their blockchain strategy, like Tamil Nadu e-governance, for example. For example, like Karnataka smart governance is also working on some their blockchain tracks. So they were separate blockchain, blockchain division in-house and created their individual roadmap for the state to develop the blockchain thing. So in different working on e-governance projects or, or some kind of uh, uh, how create the startup because like suppose Telangana with another startup in Hyderabad, in the, in the Hyderabad capital there. They have a complete ecosystem of startups based on blockchain from last six, seven years. So that is about the enterprise and governance of it. But about the ministry, about the cryptocurrency. So I think uh, all the crypto exchanges and the crypto communities interacting with that there are separate bodies are created which are interact with the government in in discussion about like how they can create some regulated framework or regulated uh, process to bring the tax session or bring the, the crypto in some regulated framework so but but i still in india there are couple of recent recent news about like whether x crypto fraud or yeah. something other uh, other exchanges so because lots of exchanges running the their crypto uh, crypto businesses in terms of without having a KYC or having a as a paper currency and converting them as a crypto. So so there is no traceability of the actual how the fund is coming. Even I was talking one of crypto exchange owner and they generally get many such customer. They come with like a, maybe ten million or maybe hundred million rupees and say like just give me the let me suppose give me some Bitcoin out of it without having a KYC. Wow. So, 
So they actually so they, come up with the money in the suitcase and say, "Yeah, here's the yeah. money. Give me the. Can you give me the yeah. number of those guys? Because I could really use that." Uh, <laughs> no, I'm yeah. just joking. Of course. So, so, so <laughs> this kind of thing is creating a problem, and some crypto exchanges will do this kind of thing in the in the background. And later, when the ED or another government department read, they not have a, not having a proper traceability how this particular. So ED is the directed. enforcement director. ED is enforcement yeah. director, which is an agency in India that enforces yeah. some of these things. Okay. Correct. So so and but even like suppose uh, one of my another co-founder like Prashant Surana Jain, he also ran the one crypto exchange, but he is following all the KYC norms, and there is no issue with him. But another another startup here now has clear visibility and just want to make more money without following the proper practices. <coughs> So let so me ask you this, right? You uh, just to sort of interrupt there because this this challenge with the cash-led economy, I think India in general, and this is the Prime Minister Modi's sort of push to digitize payments, is to remove the cash from the system that removes the dark money and the black money that that has been a burden on the overall economics in terms of money supply. Um, is it still true in the sense that people show up with? with a wad of cash think, and expect yeah, you think, to convert them into crypto and yeah. and is is that viewed as one so my vantage point Kamlesh, was that india and the emerging economy of the youth in india wants to not rely upon a job and have secondary income and have an uh, out from moving upward so the social upward mobility that is an aspiration for every youth in in, in the world viewing crypto as that sort of echelon to climb upon and, and be able to get out there a secondary income and hence the growth of 79 million plus different wallets. But then you're also telling me that you have the other sector who is trying to, um, I think it's, it's fascinating and interesting. Um, and, and, and you're right. If there's no KYC that that's against the law and that's again, this fueling money laundering business. And, and I just want to know what's the recourse there. What is the, how do you do the good and not throw the baby with the bathwater still adopt this crypto ecosystem, but have kind of, you know, governance and control when it comes down to cash transactions. So, so I think one is kind of ethics of the, the crypto exchanges who are running the business. Another like a strict, like what ED doing, what the ministry doing, and uh, like with a clear message from the RBI, uh, Real Bank of India, like they uh, don't allow this kind of transactions. So this, but I think it's still like, because the, India is a huge country and Still, the in terms of uh, uh, digitization of the payments, and still, I think uh, there are one billion transactions per month happening in a uh, in a digital wallet. But still, uh, there are there are people. There are there are more money in the cash cash cash, cash system. So I think that is very challenge to maybe this thing. Or I think if the there are good ethics player are there in the market who only do the proper KYC and then do the crypto diving. I think that's the only way to do it. Got it. And you know, one of the challenges, of course, is that India is a cash-based society, so they're used to having the freedom of utilizing cash. They're used to not running through accounts and things like that. So they're probably bringing that culture onto this world and hoping they can do the same with it. But look, on another note, you know, one of the interviews we've done just recently, of course, just last one, uh, with the UAE, was discussing the fact that Dubai is providing some 1.5 billion US dollars per annum in government support to the blockchain industry. And, uh, you know, both bringing over um, very large crypto firms, exchanges and, and, um, and developers, um, all the way down to building infrastructure within their own organization. Yet it was only a couple of months ago that we interviewed um, a group from South Africa. And we worked out that the average South African blockchain project was totally capitalized at its total value per blockchain project at 80,000 US dollars. So tiny by comparison, but they were still producing product for their community and for their environment. What are you seeing happening with the actual product that's getting produced there at sort of a grassroots level in India? What sort of products are, um, are they producing and for, for whom do they intend those to be used? So I think India, I think I believe mostly government and other initiative, larger enterprises are mostly working on some kind of uh, enterprise use cases like there is supply chain traceability in agri agriculture supply chain, digital credential, digit, like suppose IIT Kanpur, which is another premier institute issuing a degrees on blockchain. 
and like uh, like telangana government like uh, tamil nadu government or karnataka government they having a like land registry digitization on a blockchain so like mostly government or the government agencies is focusing on the using the technology not more focused to the cryptocurrency kind of uh, uh, ecosystem building but the another uh, startup ecosystem who work on the crypto ecosystem like nfts or maybe cryptos or defi or some kind of exchanges they are separate so and and that's why like uh, uh, country want to regulate uh, those things where they want to give the uh, weightage to the more technology driven solution instead of some kind of crypto and then that's why the beyond bitcoin is the topic always in in the indian leaders in indian government hold on did you say beyond bitcoin is always the topic is that what yeah, you said well then they, they should yeah. invite us to uh, this show because this show is beyond bitcoin <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah, right yeah. i picked that up too yeah, <laughs> yeah right and we're uh, available <laughs> yeah yeah even even uh, in the my ted talk ted talk i was the same topic blockchain beyond the bitcoin well that's, yeah, that's so, the thing it, it, it's so extraordinary important what you're talking about there in the creating infrastructure creating enterprise blockchains building yeah. government infrastructure talking about cbdc none of that really is directly relevant to bitcoin um and not that we're naysayers of bitcoin we just we simply are not uh we acknowledge yeah. that that bitcoin played a fundamental role in all of this and is considered a store of wealth but it is not generating the smart contracts that are building the communities that we're seeing get built around the world and hence the reason for the name um and so look so you're saying then a lot of the projects are big projects and they're government backed projects or the large enterprise projects they're getting and a lot of it's wrapped around really blockchain as a providence validation system the distributed ledger technology is that right without the cryptocurrency aspect to it yeah so so even like if i talk about this uh, cbdc so cbdc i think indian government is doing i think there is a plan to roll out in the next year so next year by quarter one there will be wholesale cbdc will be in the in, in the life and another uh, i think there is a if you know the national permanent copy from india uh, in, in, uh, so uh, the upi and all the imps kind of thing so they have building on the india level infrastructure to enable the all the payment infrastructure running on the blockchain blockchain based infrastructure so this kind of projects are big like even the uh, indian upi system is a great story and success to the world and now they are adding those system uh, back end as a blockchain So can you give us an, an idea there so UPI so first please explain that and secondly yeah. what sort of size yeah. is that Yeah so UPI is a like a uh, uh unified payment uh interface, interface. So it's okay. simply like for example you just scan the QR code and you can make a payment you can enter a mobile number and can make a payment and that is a some kind of real time payment and you can do maybe uh, one cent transaction to the maybe uh, thousands of trans a dollar transaction in a in a in a real time and in current volume is around a billion transaction happening every month and that is a huge because yeah. even the mastercard or maybe visa is doing globally that is happening only in india by the upi kind of system and uh, also like whenever you do travel there is a fast track kind of system that is another kind of you just cross a toll booth automatically you are um, uh, balance with data from your account uh, via the automatic uh, uh, reading code and all is running by the payment system backend by npci and they are working on some kind of blockchain based layer on all the this products where the upi will be running on top of blockchain uh, like fast tech kind of systems running on a blockchain based layer to and if this kind of uses then this this will be the great example even more powerful than the china blockchain ecosystem You know what's interesting yeah, so, there is that, of course, the UPI, which um, you know, Nitin, you've had so much experience in this over the years, generating payment gateways and systems such as that, um, and this is enterprise-based. Plus, yeah. you're utilizing blockchain to validate the transactions. So it's not the sort of the the distributed ledger technology that we often talk about here. This open source world. This is utilizing the accounting system to validate. existing transaction systems and 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 really value add to what already exists is that right yeah right. yeah and and so one thing on this um, kamlesh just pre bring up because i actually went and spent some time in delhi in teaching 
uh, cohort from Astros Union, um, again, entrepreneurs and folks who are trying to understand the space. And and one may, it's, it's my give back to the country that I'm from. <clears throat> one thing that came up was, so NPCI is National Payment Corporation of India that created this sort of UPI, which is Universal Payment Interface, which is digitizing the payment. So this is basically the, the hawkers and the vendors uh, who may not want to be in cash-led economy and, and, and be able to, for you to be able to buy vegetables, for example, using this QR code. And it makes the payment velocity much faster. So it's efficient, uh, but it's still serving, as as Kamlesh mentioned, a billion transactions per month. Still, ha- India has a long way to go to address the 1.4 billion people who are in the country. And then, Kamlesh, as you know, there was a, and you shared this on LinkedIn, by the way, you shared this thing from um, the, the paper from RBI on yeah. the digital rupee, which is the CBDC. And the question that I asked my students and the cohorts that I was working off is that we already have UPI and everybody's singing praises of UPI and how efficient it is in the country. So when you already have four payment systems in the country, UPI is one of them for domestic payments, then what is the impetus that drives the central bank digital currency initiative, which I think is progressive, that you're not sitting on your laurels, you're constantly looking into it and all the payment systems, the NFTS and RTGS and UPI and many of the other systems that are riding on the existing rails are efficient. They're doing their job to serve the 1.4 billion people in the country for varied payments. India is the only country that serves the real-time security settlement system anywhere in the world. And now they're progressing towards a DLT base. So none of these systems are DLT based, except the central bank digital currency is envisioned to be a blockchain-based system. So love to get your thoughts thinking as to what's driving, in spite of having all these innovations, they continue to say, we're not going to rest at this. We're going to do more and do better, which I think is fantastic. But I'd love to get your thoughts on what's driving that. Yeah. So I think uh, all other different initiatives in the payment industry for the blockchain are different to maybe make the current system efficient. But the CBDC perspective, like there's the same argument every, always, even the, most people here, like we have a very strong and stable system like UPI, why we need a retail CBDC. Also, CBDC could be the could be the, the first point because you are making the payment between the banks. But retail CBDC may be not required. But what I believe, the government have a different agenda to how they can create the new use cases out of retail CBDC. For example, like programmable money, like for example, like India uh, government may distribute lots of money to the farmer or to some to the particular person. So how you could program the money like this money could be used for the particular this purpose only. So this kind of use cases are in the plan to uh, like simply like for example like in India maybe like government India gives subsidy to maybe use this particular money to maybe only buy a fertilizer or seed. But there is no track like whether the farmer is buying the fertilizer or seed or he is buying something else. So the the plan to use CBDC kind of thing, you could program the particular tokens and then token will be used for the particular purpose only. So Mm -hmm. this is the kind of the use cases they have have in mind. Like when the CBDC will be introduced, you can program the money, you can program the token and you accordingly to whatever the uh, program meant for, or money meant for, it will be used for that purpose only. Got it. No, no, that's, uh, that's super interesting. Um, you know, I think uh, this is, again, yet to be seen uh, launching, a, I believe, in 2023, um, and that galvanizes the moment, right? It's not just about, quote, unquote, crypto. And yes, it is always going to be a beyond Bitcoin conversation anywhere in the world. And, and Derek, good job for, for picking the name for our show, because it's going to be relevant no matter you know what anybody mentioned. I think we should copyright it so we can monetize it at some point. Uh, but, but that aside, I think, uh, Kamlesh, those insights were truly valuable, especially you know, um, love to visit Indoor sometimes uh, and and see what, what the hell's going on with the startup ecosystem. I have been energized every time I go to India in terms of energy of the youth and the young folks who are trying to build and understand the global system. So whatever the building is, of course, made in India, but it's made for the world, which I think is such a powerful statement that India is coming out with. Uh, to me, gives a hope as an Indian, but also gives me uh, a tremendous amount of joy and pride that uh, the community is coming so well together and supporting uh, and embarking on the opportunities that crypto has to present. Of course, with every good thing comes the sidelines, which as you mentioned, the KYC challenges, the cash economy, which I'm hoping over time that changes. 
So I'll pause here, Derek, and I know we could talk for hours, but back to you. Well, I've got to say, this journey around the world that we all continue to take is extraordinary because we get to understand what different cultures are doing and interpreting it. I mean, Dubai, with their large amount of money building infrastructure and putting their entire governments on the blockchain, um, is extraordinary. And then, you know, South Africa, we talked about before, um, and, and their just need for tiny little micro blockchains that they're creating small communities out of. India plays another role too, of course, and that is that you know, you're an enormous supplier of software engineers all around the world. You know, literate, numeric, capable of being able to develop software products and, and this world is, is going to be in need of you. I think it's going to be really interesting to see not just what government payment systems are getting developed there, but what your communities are going to develop in India because you have an extraordinarily diverse range of cultures and languages and, and religions there that are different communities. It'll be fascinating to see what they create in the form of non-fungible tokens and community-driven products. Um, what are your thoughts there? So I think you're right, right like India is a kind of uh, uh, supplier for the software developers and especially in the, currently in the blockchain ecosystem, similarly, like there are multiple initiatives by the government itself to create the blockchain developers or blockchain engineers so like so there is a nascom with a with a industry it body which take care about the create the digital skills so even like my my organization indian blockchain institute which is a tech training arm of the system for future tech is partner with the nascom to create the blockchain developer and engineer this is another mm -hmm. initiative another like suppose the uh, as a v top 30 50 influencer created the india blockchain forum so there is forum is talk about the educating the educating the people educating the government or getting the ecosystem of developers so and there are many such initiatives like indian blockchain institute like upgrade like idoreka and many different ad tech platform emerged in the last 4 to 5 years who are working on the blockchain training and education so so the, so we can create a mm -hmm. more developers and who can need who can fulfill the need of the blockchain development while they building a blockchain product and services for the customers for India and out for the world. Mm. Well, I've got to say, it's just, um, watch this space because we have spoken about this so many times, Nick, and the fact that India is so enormous and is a major user in this and possibly the largest user in the world that are just not dedicated only to investment but utilising the transaction aspect of this. Uh, and it will continue to grow. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you also for sharing a little bit of the sense of India, bringing back memories of when I visited India, which is beeping sounds of horns in the background and kids chatting away. It feels like we're really there. Uh, <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us, Nitin. Yeah, no, thank yeah, you, thank Kamlesh, you. for taking time during vacation and enjoy Indore. Uh, someday I'll visit uh, Indore um, just to kind of get the feel uh, you know, of the city and town. But thanks again for making time and uh, we will, you know, looking forward to the next chat at some point. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nerek. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed our weekly conversation. If you have any questions, comments or suggested topics, please contact Nitin Gower or myself on the emails displayed here or via our LinkedIn profiles. Feel free to subscribe and share with like-minded friends. Stay well, inquisitive and engaged. See you next week.